I'm going to focus on several ways that I think we in the Christian churches, and particularly from my perspective in the Uniting Church, are encouraging an approach to living in a multi-faith society that will contribute to respectful and flourishing human communities for the common good. I think multi-faith relations are grounded in relationship, and Shoshana has highlighted that. Our Uniting Church Assembly Working Group on Relation with Other Faiths have described this as friendship in the presence of difference. The word friendship, they write, is chosen because it includes a sense of growing relationship, empathy, warmth and care for others. Our Christian uneasiness in the presence of difference is something we need to recognise and address. Rabbi, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs put it well when he said, in our interconnected world, we must learn to feel enlarged, not threatened by, distant, by difference. And we confess that we're particularly saddened when persons and groups claiming to speak in the name of Christ vilify those of other faiths, deny them the rights others enjoy, or use them as scapegoats when addressing society's problems. Our work group on other faiths goes on to affirm that in friendship with those who believe differently, we are faced by sharp questions that drive us to a re-examination of our own faith and rediscovery of treasures in our own tradition that have been lost or become misshapen. That in dialogue with other faiths, our own faith is enriched and deepened. And our most important task in the presence of other faiths is to rediscover Christian discipleship as a reconciling, prophetic and hospitable way of life. Following Jesus will lead us into gracious and compassionate living that leads to healing and reconciling in communities that, of which we're part. So relationship is at the heart of Christian theology. God invites us into relationship, loving God with our whole being and loving our neighbour. Loving interfaith dialogue is also grounded in Christian anthropology, that all people are created in God's image and infinitely loved by God. When I see the other through God's lens, then it leads to an understanding that when I encounter the other, I am entering into sacred space. Joan Chittister, a feminist theologian, writes, we are, if we are to take scripture seriously, surrounded by the presence of God in one another. The implications of that kind of theological worldview turn the social system upside down. If we are all words of God, then we all have something to say. We are all a message to the rest of the world of the nature and mind of God. We are all expressions of divine presence, of divine hope, of divine truth. We are all meant to be word to one another. I want to touch briefly on three other key themes. Formation in faith identity, theology as conversation, and creating communities of dialogue. I believe that we need to engage in, from my perspective as a Christian educator, Christian formation which nurtures people deeply in Christian identity that is open to the other. Letty Russell was a feminist Christian educator who described two contrasting ways of Christian formation. She notes that we can form people in ways that focus on the circumference, that is drawing a circle around ourselves and defining ourselves over against the other, by, by, whom we are, by who we are against, the kind of them and us kind of formation. Or we can form people in Christian faith by focusing on the centre, our identity in Christ, without having to define ourselves against others. We are in Christ, a reconciled and compassionate people, called to live lives that embody God's desire for our world, lives of peace with justice, healing, forgiveness and hope. We can nurture Christian identity with openness to other expressions of religious faith. We can nurture our children and young people in ways that deepen their Christian journey with respect for others who share other different religious beliefs. One of my little show and tells is this beautiful book by Desmond Tutu and Douglas Abrams, which talks about God's dream for the world. Um, these kinds of books and other resources shape our children in ways that are respectful of others and create flourishing human communities. Robert Morris, a um, Episcopal priest, writes, there is a matched pair of basic human needs that the Creator surely intends to travel together, our need for a deep and distinct identity 
is balanced by the need to find things in common. The stranger carries both the threat of change and the promise of new and unanticipated gifts. I also want to talk about theology as conversation. As a theological educator, I'm concerned that we educate people in ways that we are accountable for our theology. In July, I met with 100 young adults from various churches in Sydney. They've gathered together over the past 10 years for a school of discipleship. We talked about theology as conversation, that our theology grows over time and is shaped in dialogue and praxis and community. The conversation or dialogue occurs between us and God, it takes place with other people in community and in our wider society, it takes place in our universities and our workplaces and amongst our family and friends, and the spirit is part of this conversation. There have been many times in my life when I've had fixed ideas or biases that have been challenged and at times dismantled because God has brought into my life people who brought different worldviews and perspectives. And if we are prepared to enter into those kinds of encounters with openness and respect, they can be life transforming, not only for us as individuals, but for our communities and societies. And I would name this as the transformative work of the Holy Spirit from my Christian perspective. And as I noted earlier, these conversations, friendships that I've had with people from various religious traditions and atheists and agnostics, have deepened and expanded my own journey with God and my understanding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I also think we need to be accountable for our theology. Some feminist theologians critiqued theological education a number of years ago and noted that we need to recognise that our theology is not ahistorical or objective, it's grounded in human reality. So we need to recognise that sometimes we have narratives of hope and narratives of harm. And I want to give you two examples from Christian theology. If I perpetrate a theology that says, if people don't believe this and follow this particular worldview, and then they're going to hell, that will have consequences. It may give me a sense of urgency in seeking to bring people into my faith tradition or perspective. It may be that this is the focus of our relationship with others. It may have me pitying the other, or it may have me dismissing their point of view. If I perpetrate another example of a theology which supports the inequality of women and men, that also has consequences. And this is particularly in the light of celebrating White Ribbon Day yesterday. For some women, the Christian theology that says that man is the head and women are to be submissive to the man has kept them in abusive relationships out of a sense of loyalty to their faith. This is something we need to take responsibility for as Christians when our theology has that kind of impact on individuals and communities and whole societies. On the other hand, if I have a theology that focuses on God's expansive love and compassion, God's desire for reconciliation among all people and with the creation, that will also have consequences for human community and our relationship with the world. I also want to touch on the idea of communities of dialogue. Amongst the leaders of Christian churches in the South Australian Council of Churches, we have this idea of receptive ecumenism. Dennis Edwards, in presenting to the South Australian Council of Churches, talks about the question of receptive ecumenism is, what can we learn or receive with integrity from our various others in order to facilitate our own growth together into deepened communion in Christ and the Spirit? The assumption behind receptive ecumenism is, if we all were asking and acting upon this question, all of us might be moving in ways that might open up unforeseeable ecumenical possibilities. I think if we applied that to our relationship with other faiths, it would open up amazing gifts for us. John Paul II uh, had this lovely idea that dialogue is not simply an exchange of ideas. In some ways, it is always an exchange of gifts. And the other sign of hope I want to finish with is that we live in a multicultural and intercultural Australia where our children are young and young people are growing up in those communities. A wonderful example of this is the International Baccalaureate Program that's spread throughout Australia and across the world. They have this fantastic topic called the theory of knowledge. In that theory of knowledge, the young people are encouraged to critically think about their own ideas and ideologies in relationship to other cultures and in the wider world to be aware of themselves as thinkers, encouraging them to become 
um, more acquainted with the complexity of knowledge and recognise the need to act responsibly in an increasingly interconnected but uncertain world. I know my daughter went deeper into her own faith tradition because she was conversing in theory of knowledge and in her broader group of colleagues with people who were atheist, people who were devout in their Jewish and Islamic faith. This also speaks to the importance of communities, communities that nurture dialogue and curiosity within the context of love and care and seeing the beauty in the other. We hope that our religious communities are these kinds of communities and that we also create public spaces like this conversation that encourages us to be in conversation with one another towards a society marked by peacemaking, reconciliation, love, justice and hope, a society in which we all can flourish. Thank you.